Hi everyone, our next topic is program design for plyometric training. In the next series of videos, we are going to overview the mechanics and physiology of plyometric exercise, discuss principles of plyometric program design, and finally, highlight methods of safely and effectively performing specific plyometric exercises. So plyometric exercises refer to those activities that enable a muscle to reach maximal force in the shortest possible time. In other words, to produce max power. Plyometrics uh, consist of quick, powerful movements using a pre-stretch, also known as a counter movement, that involves the stretch shortening cycle. And the purpose of plyometric exercise is to increase the power of subsequent movements by using both the natural elastic components of muscle and tendon, as well as what is known as the stretch reflex. Studies have shown that when used correctly, plyometric training consistently improves muscle force and power production and may decrease the risk of injuries during practice and games. And this increased production of power is best explained by two proposed models the mechanical and the neurophysiological models. In the mechanical model, elastic energy in the muscular tendinous components is increased with a rapid stretch, also known as an eccentric muscle action, and then stored. If a concentric muscle action follows immediately, the stored energy is released contributing to the total force production by naturally returning the muscles and tendons to their unstretched configuration. Now, as we've talked about way back in Module 1, it's the contractile component of skeletal muscle, so again, actin, myosin, and cross bridges. Those are the prim that is the primary source of muscle force production during a concentric muscle action. Now the parallel elastic component that you see here, consisting of the layers of connective tissue, including the epimesium, paramecium, endomesium, and sarcolemma, they exert a passive force with unstimulated muscle stretch. But however, of the mechanical model's many elements is the series elastic component that is the work workhorse of plyometric exercise. While the SEC includes some muscular components, it is the tendons that constitute the majority of the SEC. And when the musculotendinous unit is stretched, as occurs during an eccentric or lengthening muscle action, the SEC acts as a spring as it is lengthened, and as it lengthens, elastic energy is stored. Now, if a muscle begins a concentric or shortening action immediately after the eccentric or lengthening action, the stored energy is released, allowing for the SEC to contribute to the total force production, again, naturally returning the muscles and tendons to their unstretched configuration. However, if a concentric muscle action does not occur immediately following the eccentric action, or if the eccentric phase is too long or requires too great of a motion about a given joint, then that stored energy dissipates and is simply lost as heat. The neurophysiological model involves the potentiation of the concentric muscle action by use of what is known as the stretch reflex. Now the stretch reflex is the body's involuntary response to an external stimulus that stretches the muscle. This reflexive component of plyometric exercise is primarily composed of muscle spindle activity. So when we're talking about the muscle spindles, those are also commonly referred to as intrafusal muscle fibers that you see down here in this figure. And these muscle spindles are proprioceptive organs that are sensitive to the rate as well as the magnitude of a stretch. So when a quick stretch is detected, muscular activity reflexively increases. During plyometric exercises, the muscle spindles are stimulated by a rapid stretch, causing a reflexive muscle action, 
and this reflexive response potentiates or increases the activity within the agonist muscle, also known as the prime mover muscle, thereby increasing the force that muscle produce, produces when it contracts. So going back to these muscle spindles, as we see here, they're embedded within the belly of skeletal muscle. So when they are stretched, as occurs during a, an eccentric muscle action, the muscle spindles are activated and thus send neural signals to the spinal cord via sensory neurons. We see that here on the top, the sensory neuron. These neural signals are received within the spinal cord and then the spinal cord sends out signals via alpha motor neurons to the muscle fibers, also known as the extrafusal muscle fibers, causing a reflexive muscle action, therefore increasing muscle force production. Now, while it is likely that both the mechanical and neurophysiological models contribute to the increased production of force, seen during plyometric exercise, the degree to which each model contributes remains uncertain. The stretch shortening cycle, the SSC, combines the mechanical and neurophysiological models and is the basis for plyometric exercise. This SSC employs the energy storage capabilities of the SEC, again that storage elastic components, and stimulation of the stretch reflex to facilitate a maximal increase in muscle recruitment over a minimal amount of time. So think about the stretch shortening cycle is really a combination of the um, first model, the mechanical model we talked about, as well as the neurophysiological model discussed in the previous slide. Now the stretch shortening cycle involves three distinct phases. Phase one is known as the eccentric phase, which involves preloading the agonist muscle groups. So the agonists again are considered the prime movers. During this phase, the series elastic component stores elastic energy and the muscle spindles are stimulated. As the muscle spindles are stretched, they send a signal to the ventral root of the spinal cord via what are known as type 1A afferent nerve, fiber, nerve fibers. Excuse me. So to visualize the eccentric phase, consider the long jump as an example. The time from touchdown of the foot that we see down here to the bottom of the movement is known as the eccentric phase. And in this case of the long jump example, the agonist muscle is going to be primarily the, the calf muscle, so the gastrocnemius as well as the soleus. So the second phase is the time between the eccentric and concentric phases and is termed the amortization phase. During this delay between the eccentric and concentric muscle actions, type 1A afferent nerves synapse with the alpha motor neurons within the spinal cord. And then, then the alpha motor neurons transmit signals to the agonist muscle group. This phase of the stretch shortening cycle is perhaps the most crucial in allowing greater force production. In other words, its duration must be kept short. And if we consider the long jump example mentioned earlier, in terms of the amortization phase, once the jumper has touched down and the movement has stopped, the amortization phase has begun, and as the movement, movement begins, the amortization phase has ended. So very, very quick transition from phase one to phase three with no movement occurring within the amortization phase. The third and final phase of the stretch shortening cycle, known as the concentric phase, this is the body's response to the eccentric and the amortization phases. In this phase, the energy stored in the series elastic components during the eccentric phase either is used to increase the force of the subsequent movement or is dissipated as heat. This would occur if the amortization phase is too long, for example. Again, visualize the long jumper. 
as soon as the movement begins in the upward direction, so as soon as we have the push off basically, the amortization phase has ended and the concentric phase of the stretch shortening cycle has begun. In this example, one of the agonist muscles is the gastrocnemius within the calf. And upon touchdown, the gastrocnemius undergoes a rapid stretch as occurs in the eccentric phase. There's a brief delay in movement, also known as the amortization phase. And finally, the muscle concentrically plantar flexes the ankle, allowing the athlete to push off the ground. This is referred to as the concentric phase. So if we apply the information we've learned thus far, looking at three different jumps. First, we have the static squat jump where the athlete would squat down to a semi-squat position, hold this, let's say, for you know two to three seconds, and then jump up as high as you could. And then next, we have a counter-movement jump. In this case, the athlete is using her arms, and then doing a rapid pre-stretch or eccentric muscle action, this time not holding that downward position, but explosively jumping up as high as possible. And with the approach jump, we see the athlete is basically getting a running head start. We see here the uh, planting of the foot. We have the rapid pre-stretch of the quadricep here, as well as the gastrocnemius and other calf muscles in this example. And then the athlete would propel him or herself up as uh, high as possible. So of these three, think about which one would result in the greatest rate of muscular tendinous stretch and thus the greatest jump height.